right. Good Monday morning. Okay, so already this morning. All right, so um, today's plant. We have go to cola. Oh, what am I doing? Go to cola. <laughs> my my brain was doing one thing. My muscles were like on on autopilot. Go to cola. <laughs> Uh, and this is Centella Asiatica. Now, previously, um, um, so, um, previously it was in the Hydrocodal genus, but it is now in the Centella. Uh, gene. So, uh, Centella asiatica, and it is in the Apiaceae family. And so, this is the uh, this is the parsley family, the carrot family. So. And we have it growing right out here, so oh, I can nice. show you yeah. after class. It is a it's a um, it's a great plant to grow if you it, come on. There we go. Um, you need to give it the right environment, and it's hard to give it the right environment in Southern California um, because it's so hot and dry, and it likes hot and damp, and we don't do damp around here really well. We do in the winter, and so it grows nicely in the winter, but it likes that combination. And again, if you think of where it comes from, this is a plant uh, from India. So this is a, a plant of the um, Ayurvedic tradition. So this is a one of the premier plants of the Ayurvedic tradition. Um, and so I'll be sharing you know, information about it um, in using... Ayurvedic terminology and concepts, but I want to be like super clear about the fact that I'm not trained uh, as an Ayurvedic practitioner, um, and I'm trained as a Western practitioner, and I know a little tiny bit about Ayurvedic medicine. So um, for specific information about Ayurvedic purposes, it probably would be better to go to a, an Ayurvedic practitioner for that information. So I'm speaking about it largely as a Western herbalist. So just for transparency and clarity there. So we have our tea of good colon. So it's a lovely kind of golden color. Generally, when we have um, green plants, right, so this is good cola. This is the fresh plant. Um, when we have green plants, even if we have fresh plants, oftentimes the, the tea itself won't be as deeply green as the plant. Um, sometimes when you have very, very, very fresh plant material, but in dry plant material, it often turns out more like a deep golden color or brown color because chlorophyll is poorly soluble in water. Uh, so you don't get that, that rush of green. You get that in alcohol. You get that in, in other but so this is a lovely uh, shade for it. If we breathe it in, what do you breathe? What do you smell? It's a very mild fragrance. Yeah, very mild. But pretty distinctive. Hi. Hi. Pretty distinctive. Um, Hi. There you go. It's also quite hot to see. Here. Each one of the comfy chairs. I was trying to think of an alliterative alternative to comfy and crunchy is what came up. Um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the Santa the smell. Yeah. The smell. Grassy a little bit, maybe? Grassy. Yeah, it has that sort of rich kind of floral too, though. Smell, yeah. Same kind. 
Thank yeah. you, Cyril. A lot of it, times these remind me of honey. I think it's just because I associate mm -hmm. putting honey with it, though. Right, Maybe sure. That's what it is. Kind of Sometimes they do. When you when we do uh, linden, linden smells oh, just honey. like honey. It's amazing. Uh, Rosa, good morning. Its shape looks like a heart. Um, so yeah, it, it does. Yes. So it has the the points on top, and then it goes down. Not not quite to a point, but it does on the top. Totally has that heart shape, right? Some people think mm -hmm. it's shaped like a brain, also, right? So heart like a brain. Yeah, but I have thought about that a little hard. Yeah. There you go. Then, let's see. There. I can't hold it and do a little hard at the same time. <laughs> there. Uh, okay. All right. So then take a sip and then see what is similar, what is different from what we smell versus what we taste. It's got a really mild flavor. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's kind of like smooth, but not not super pungent. A mild flavor, smooth, not too pungent. Yeah. On that spectrum, sometimes is a helpful kind of concept, right? We have a spectrum that plants hang out in, and on one end, there's like foods. They're just nourishing their foods, and so we would put herbs like oat straw there, right? It's just nourishing and good for you. Yeah. And on the other side, we have poisons, mm -hmm. right? So we would put like um, um, the, the alkaloids from deadly nightshade over there, right? So total poison, total food. And so our medicinal plants kind of exist along that spectrum somewhere. And sometimes they're like super nourishing. That's why we take them. And sometimes they're very strong medicine. And so it's kind of helpful sometimes to think about how it feels to our body, how it tastes, where does it land on that spectrum? That also tells us a lot about dosing strategies, right? And whether it's good to take it long-term versus short-term, right? If we, um, medicines are not made, medicines don't nourish us. They might um, heal us, mm -hmm. but they generally don't provide that long-term nourishing effect. So where does this feel then? If you think about that spectrum, And sometimes it isn't immediately apparent. Sometimes you have to kind of build a relationship with it, but it's helpful just to kind of get an immediate sense of that. I would guess more on the nourishing food side. Mm -hmm. of more on the nourishing food side. Yeah, it doesn't have a lot of the flavors that I would associate with something that is toxic. Right. Yeah. Um, generally, toxins in plants. Plants like to announce the fact that we're making yeah. toxins. So That's oftentimes, so now that isn't always so, right? So we were just doing comfrey the other week, right? And comfrey's yummy. It's delicious, but it does have a toxic compound in it that does have an effect on the body. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't always assume that a, a poisonous plant is going to taste poison. Is going to tell us that something that is yummy is always nourishing but it's helpful to think about. It's helpful to think about when we're tasting it and when we're kind of learning about it. But I agree with you. It feels, it tastes to me very just kind of food-like and nourishing. And when you think about it being in the APACA family, right? This is a family that we get a lot of our foods from. This is celery and, um, and carrots. Um, now, it is also a poison family. This is also the family of poison hemlock. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, we do want to be cautious. Um, oftentimes, if we're like out in the wild where we're doing like plant identification in the wild, if we get close enough to APACA, oftentimes we want to like kind of stop and go, OK, I'm going to proceed with caution. We don't need to proceed with caution with goat cola because the chemistry of goat cola is very, very safe and it's very nourishing. And so it has none of the of the cautions chemically that one might associate, one might reasonably say, hey, hold on a second, do we need to be cautious about this plant? It's a good question, but this is more on the, this is more on the carrot and, and celery side of the equation and less on the poison hemlock side of, of the equation of the APAC family. I am starting to notice like a mineraliness, I guess mm -hmm. saltiness. Yeah, yeah. Happy. 
Mm -hmm. So yeah, that is, um, so there's a salty flavor, yeah. And so what is salty often associated with? You know? What would you think the flavor of salty would tell you chemically as to what might be present? Minerals. Yeah, minerals, exactly, yes. And we don't think of salty in plants as salty as I'm opening them salt and putting it on my tongues, right? That is, again, on that, that spectrum of, of, of concentration. That's pure salt is what we think of when we think of salty in the dominant culture because, because our foods are so skewed. But when we think of salty in an herb sense, it is that sort of minerally, a little bit of a... Of a of a, of a metallic tang sometimes, a seaweedy sort of nature. And, um, and yeah, very pleasant saltiness. So this is a plant, go to call is a plant that grows on the sides of waterways. Um, and in that water, it sends out a lot of growth. It just grows, if you give it a lot of moisture as abundant moisture, flowing water uh, as you can give it, it will just spread and spread and spread and spread and spread and spread and spread. Um, and as it's going along those banks of, of flowing water, it's taking up nutrients from, from the water. It's very good at taking up nutrients very rapidly. Now that does mean that we have to be really careful about where the gotu cola that we get grows. Because if we're getting gotu cola, unfortunately from India, there's a lot of problematic water sources in India. And so if they're harvesting it from the, the banks of a, of a polluted water source, the plant wants to absorb those nutrients and it's going to absorb the toxins along with it that are present in the water. So goji cola is a plant you do want to make really sure that you buy uh, organically grown. Some plants, it, it uh, doesn't matter. It's kind of like vegetables, right? There's, there's a lot of plants that tend to accumulate um, toxins from, from uh, or, or require a lot of, of pesticides and, and management, and some that don't um, go to cola is worth, worth throwing your, your a little bit extra money at, at getting uh, organically grown and avoid getting it really from, from India. Um, so uh, it's in the EPC family, so salty. Um, uh, what other flavors do you taste with it? I have a little bit of water. Mm -hmm. I'm getting like rocks, but I feel like that's the minerals. Rocks? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I taste a little bit of a, a flavor that I associate with goji cola. And here, I don't know if I taste the flavor because I know the chemistry of the plant um, or if it's actually there, um, but I taste a soapiness to it, a, a bitter resinous, and it's, it's a mouthfeel also of kind of breaking down stuff. It, it, it kind of cleans the inside of the mouth. Um, so, um, and that soapy flavor uh, is the presence of saponins. And these are some of the really important compounds um, in go-to cola are, um, so we have the minerals, it does tend to be mineral rich. Um, and um, uh, So saponin glycosides are a large family of, of uh, compounds that are in, uh, in goji cola and considered to be some of the primary um, therapeutic constituents. So there's some, and I think I have them on your um, the thing. Oh, I don't have them listed specifically on there. Um, so there's uh, Asiatica side. And uh, the, uh, one of the other common names of go-to cola is um, Brahmi. We'll talk about that in just a, a moment. So another, 
Brahmi is another common name for good to call. Remember that plants often have, will have multiple common names when we go to the Latin name for clarity. Um, and here definitely we, we do that. So, um, so Asiatic aside, Brahmi is that another common name. And um, uh, there are Brahmin uh, osides. I think it's brahminocytes. Um, uh, uh, so you can see how they pull the common, uh, the, the names of the chemicals from the names of the plant. And that's often how I will remember the names of the chemicals. Is you can just look and, and, and get a, a clue from the, uh, from the common or the Latin names. So those glycosides are responsible for a lot of the therapeutic effects of go-to cola. So, um, and the, the presence of minerals and the presence of phenolic compounds, flavonoids. It's abundant. So if we put all of that together, we can look at why we use go-to cola. So why we use go-to cola, let's go back to its, its um, being named after Brahmi. So Brahmi is a, uh, a Hindu deity, and uh, he is said to be uh, one of the, the deities associated with creation. It's said that Brahmi thought creation into being. So he, um, he is associated largely with, um, with learning, with thought, with, um, with intelligence, with, with things having to do with the, uh, the central nervous system in the brain. Um, it's the common name. I was going to say, when I drank it, I almost immediately felt uh, more grounded. Uh -huh. I was like, oh. Yeah, yeah. We didn't go through the, the, the energetics, did we? Um, yeah, yeah, I know. It, it very much is a, is a, a stimulant, a mental stimulant for me, and also has that, that grounding quality. And again, I think a lot of plants that have that kind of nourishing flavor and taste and feel mm -hmm. give us that grounding yeah. feel, right? It's like, a, yes, we're giving your body exactly what it needs. Mm -hmm. we're, we're giving you stability. And in this plant, it's stability of, of, of mental function, right? Go to call is used to enhance clarity and learning. There are uncountable um, uh, clinical studies and stories and, and uh, um, evidence of traditional usage of goju cola being used for enhancement of brain function, for mental clarity and focus, for um, protection of the brain, and for reversing damage to the brain. Now, it is known as, so it is known as Brahmi, but its full name is, um, or a more accurate name, is Lesser. So it's lesser Brahmi because there is another plant which is called greater Brahmi. And that is a plant called Bacopa. And Bacopa is also a water loving plant, though it's not in the same family. It's also a water loving plant and, um, and it has significant effects on brain function. Significant effects, it's wonderful. The downside is Bacopa tastes funky. Bacopa is just, it's bitter and soapy and just, it's icky. Um, it's really, really good for you. It's, it's, it's very therapeutic. But Bacopa is a plant that generally I prefer to take as a tincture because it's just not um, the yummiest taste. Where goju cola is much easier, as you said, it's, it's pretty easy to use it as it's neutral enough that you can use it as a base for a lot of, of teas or just drink it by itself, and it's fine. So, brahmi. So, goju cola is, is one of the primary plants we use as a brain tonic, um, and it is what um, in Ayurveda is referred to as a medya rasayana. Rasayana is a plant that is good for all body types. So you know that in, um, in Ayurvedic medicine in, and in Western medicine and Chinese medicine, we um, have 
different constitutional states, right? In, in Ayurveda, we the three primary constitutional states are the Vata and Pitta and Kapha states. And that refers to different body types and how they respond to different uh, energetics of plants and foods and all of that. Um, so a Rasayana plant is a plant that is good for all body types. A Medya Rasayana is a plant that's good for all brain types. So Goju Kola is said to be beneficial for irrespective of what type of, of, um, of mental dysfunction condition you're dealing with, Goju Kola is going to be an important uh, nourishing and tonifying plant for brain function. And it does have a, a, a relatively immediate kind of grounding and soothing um, effect and, and that clarity. Well, it's also very calming and relaxing. So uh, one of the cool um, studies that they've done on goju cola is in healthy adults that they gave goju cola to, it decreases startle response. That's someone coming up and jump scaring you, right? Boo! And what is that startle response, right? The heart pounding and the breath and your, your, your heckles go up, right? All of that is the stress response. That is a very good indicator of where you are in that, in that adaptation, right? In that, that adaptation to stress level. If you are very non-resilient and you have very little adaptation to stress, or if you're pretty good and you've got some, some good resilience, um, this is one of the effects of goju cola as an adaptogen. So we do use goju cola as, as an adaptogen. And it is one of the few adaptogens that you see that is a leaf and not more of a dense root, which makes it a lot easier to formulate with if you're making teas, right? So in, uh, if you're making teas and you want adaptogens, the two primary ones that I use are goju cola and tulsi, both from the Ayurvedic uh, tradition uh, and both nice tasting and both great for long term use. So, goju cola um, is increasing clarity and focus, increasing memory and concentration, but decreasing stress response, calming the body, giving us more of that grounding. Um, and so, it's 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 uh, tremendously beneficial for that. But the other thing that it does. Um, also, because of these glycosides and because of all of these flavonoids and minerals, this is one of our primary tissue tonics as well. So the other primary system that goju cola supports is the integumentary system or the skin. So for skin, hair, nails, for um, deeper, for musculoskeletal tissue, for ligament and tendon, for the production of, 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 um, of what are called uh, gags. Gags, so structural gags. Gags are glycosaminoglycosides, right? So Gags is much easier to remember, um, but these are um, these glycosides improve the production of the glycosides that we have in our body, and these are things like hyaluronic acid. Have you heard of this one? I've seen that in, in like skincare stuff. Exactly, in yeah. skincare stuff. Hyaluronic acid is a fluid in the body. It's a it's a, a compound in the body that allows cells to hold moisture. And so it's really good for dry tissue states. It's good for dry skin. But it's also used uh, for increasing vision for people who are um, uh, elders or have conditions that affect uh uh, vision health, taking hyaluronic acid orally increases the ability of the eyeball to hold moisture in it. It increases the ability of synovial fluid to be produced. And that's the, that's the uh, fluid that lubricates the joints. Um, so uh, synovial fluid. Uh, and then also, have you ever heard of glucosamine? Glucosamine is a compound that you become more familiar with as you get older or if you have old dogs. Glucosamine is a compound that increases production of cartilage. 
So wherever we have cartilage in the body, um, uh, supplementation with glucosamine increases the formation of new healthy cartilage tissue. And so we see glucosamine often used as supplements. All of these, uh, or many of these are used as supplements to improve elasticity and health and tissue integrity and improve healing of, of or reduction of symptoms of joint disorders, arthritis, um, tendonitis, things like that. So go to call it increases production of structural gaps of all of these things. So when we see um, those kind of deeper tissue weakness um, uh, conditions, it's going to be a plant that we can use for that. It's a very good at decreasing production of, of, um, uh, of, uh, Scar tissue also. So we can take it, we can give it to people who are um, who are recovering from surgery um, or who have a wound. We can use go to quality taken internally as a tea, but you can also infuse it into oil. So it is one of the plants that I almost always put into my um, infused oils now. Anytime I'm making something for the skin, um, uh, anytime I'm making something for the skin, I'm almost always infusing go to call it into it. Um, so in fact, um, and in Ayurvedic medicine, goju kol is often infused into ghee. So ghee is a clarified butter. If you don't use butter, you can use another oil for this. Sesame oil is often used. But if you infuse goju kol into sesame oil or ghee um, uh, and then strain it out, it's often used in Ayurvedic medicine as a, uh, as a nausea oil, which is our oils that are, that are applied to the inside of the uh, uh, nostrils. Um, and uh, what I often do to, 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 to apply them is I get a, a dropper bottle, just like a tincture bottle. And if you lay your head over the, the side of your bed, you can hold or have someone else hold the dropper. It's easier to have someone else hold or pre-measure the amount of fluid that you're taking up into the dropper to be about two or three drops, right? Lay your head over and then squeeze the oil into your sinuses and then sniff really, really um, uh, hard. And, uh, and then you can kind of distribute it there. It's one of the best things for very dry, delicate, irritated, reactive uh, nasal mucosa, but it is also one of the ways that they use gotukola for brain function. And they say that taking the gotukola that way is able to get it kind of more directly into brain function and activity. Mm -hmm. And so it's used um, just for mental clarity in the nausea treatment, as well as taking it as a tea or taking it as an infused oil. The nice thing, or, or taking it as a, a tincture. So you can use it as a tincture, you can use it as a, as a nausea oil treatment, you can use it as a tea. Um, you can um, drink it, oh, I should have. When you're saying nausea. Oh, yes, I'm not, sorry. It's not nausea, right? No, it it's isn't. Na it's nasal. It's, At first I thought you were yeah. saying like, yeah, it's good for nausea. Yeah, no, I should, thank you. There you go, N-A-S-Y-A. Nausea is a, is a treatment protocol. Um, in class the other day, because this is one of the, uh, this is one of the plants for my apprenticeship uh, this month. Um, uh, Sherry, one of my students brought in a bottle of, um, of pennywort drink, which is goju cola. That's one of the other common names. Penny wart. So the suffix wart is uh, uh, just means plant. Anytime you see wart, it just means plant. And um, penny, because also along with looking like a heart or looking like a brain, it's round. And so looking quickly, you could say, yeah, it sort of looks like a, a penny, sort of. Um, uh, Oh, thank you, Rosa. Oh, I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. Yeah, we all start into this at different levels of learning, and you just you get whatever you um, what you can from the um, from the class. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thanks. Um, let's see. So for um, so for skin support, so infused into an oil, taken as a nausea treatment, uh, as a tincture, as a tea, it's a plant that applies itself uh, widely. Or using, if you see it, if you go into a uh, um, uh, like an Indian um, uh, 
uh, grocery store, they will often have the penny wart mm -hmm. juice. It's a sweetened Coca Cola drink, and you drink it as a as a fresh little refreshing tea uh, juice, not a tea, like a juice. So. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. Any questions about any of that? Yes. Yes. When you are talking with the nausea treatment, uh -huh. um, is that the Coca Cola infused in oil? Yes. Or ghee? Or ghee. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can infuse it. If you infuse it in ghee, of course, you need to warm the ghee up to make it a, a liquid. Uh -huh. um, um, but uh, but yeah, it, it melts. If you just put it in your hand, it'll just melt so quickly. Yeah. Uh, and then you can just pull up a, a few drops in the in a dropper and then oh, apply it. Uh, of the oil. Of the so oil. if you make a ghee infused, um, good to call it in ghee. Um, mm -hmm. The ghee is solid right. at room temperature. So you oh. take a little bit out and put it in the palm of your hand mm -hmm. and the warmth of your hand will, will liquefy it. Because otherwise you can like put a chunk into your right. nose. <laughs> But it's better to pre-liquify it. You don't want to like put it into something hot because you don't want hot oil to go into your nostrils, right? So just a, a chunk in your hand, just let it melt there. And you can also just kind of assess two or three drops. It is easy to um, overfill. So I, I took a dropper, I had a, 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 an oil, someone made a nausea oil treatment in a dropper bottle. So you mix the oil with a bee? You infuse goju cola into ghee. Into the ghee. Yes. Oh, okay. So put ghee into a jar uh, with goju cola and uh, put it into a double uh, boiler, right? Into water to, to heat it, and um, and uh, then let it uh, sit for. Um, bring it up to just where the water simmers for a little bit and then turn it off so the the residual heat from the water will warm up the ghee and that'll warm up the, the goju cola. Do that a couple of times during the day of that warming and cooling and warming cooling and that will extract it. Um, there are traditional ways of, uh, that uh, Ayurvedic infused oils are made that are dramatically different than that and are worth... Um, Looking at if you're really, really into making oils and you want to make infused ones just like um, Ayurveda, we actually have time. Um, it's actually really fascinating. Um, so when you make an infused oil of a plant, one of the concerns, one of the medicine making concerns that we always have when we're making medicine is the solubility of plant constituents, right? What is soluble in oil and what's soluble in water? Can I make it into a tea or can I make it into a, uh, an infused oil? And oftentimes those are two different things, right? So we talk about that quite a lot in, in, in classes. Um, and so when we make an infused oil, um, we, grind the herb and we put it into a jar and we cover it with oil and we let it seat. Sometimes we're putting heat on it. Sometimes we're not. Strain it out and now we've got our infused oil. Sometimes we will use an intermediary solvent. So are you familiar with that concept where you treat the, the herb before adding the oil? You treat it with uh, alcohol, mm -hmm. right? So the alcohol is a second type of solvent. So you're, you're grinding your calendula grind your calendula to a, a fine powder, and then you add just a little bit of alcohol, and that starts to extract the constituents, starts to break those bonds that the, chemi the chemicals in the plant have to the, to the fiber, the cellulose of the plant. And then you go in afterwards with oil, and now that alcohol has done some of the extraction, and then the oil does the rest of the extraction, you get a significantly more powerful um, formula from that. Um, so that was uh, part of the medicine making. If you look at the national formularies, the official medicine making processes in the United States uh, pharmacopoeia, that was official medicine making um, uh, up until that the last, uh, the last uh, national formulary that had that was like in the 40s. Um, but, uh, but now we've kind of rediscovered that and we're starting to use that a lot in our, in our medicine making. In Ayurvedic medicine, what they've done is they've taken a recipe. I may get this ratio incorrect. 
but um, one, uh, one ounce of herb to eight ounces of water. Or no, I think it's, it's the other way. I could be wrong. So this is more the, the larger concept, and I'll clarify the, um, the uh, exact process. So you're going to combine all three of together, one ounce of herb, 16 ounces of water, and eight ounces of your oil, whatever your oil is. So it'll be ghee or sesame oil. Sesame oil is often used for this, and we'll get back to that because it's really interesting. So you combine these together in a pot. So you have your herbs, and then you have your oil, and then you have your water. But of course, oil and water don't mix together, right? So, but you have it a, a, a simmering. So you have it over heat, and so it's simmering, uh, and it's reducing. As it's simmering, you have the top off, and as it's simmering, what's what is going away as it's simmering? The water. The water. That's right. So, with all of these together mixed into the pot the herb is exposed to water and the water is being a solvent because it's hot water in a plant. Of course, it's gonna make a tea uh, and it's moving around in the pot. So you're getting all of that extraction of, uh, of the plant in the water. Um, but you're also getting the oil extraction because oil is also a solvent and it's in the same pot. So we're getting oil extraction of the oil soluble constituents and we're getting water extraction of the water soluble constituents, the two primary different categories of chemicals in plants. But as you're simmering it and you're losing water through re reduction, the volume is going to go down and it's going to keep going down, and it keeps going down, and you have it continue down until you're left with a total of eight ounces of fluid. And when you're left with eight ounces of fluid, that's all oil, because that's what you started with. So you extracted all of the water-soluble compounds, but then you get rid of the water. The water's not there. Now you have these water-soluble compounds. They're technically not soluble in oil, but you extracted them with water, and then you got rid of the water. Where are they going to go? They're going to go into the water. So and they're going to go into the oil. So the in, the water, the oil, they're not technically, they didn't magically become soluble in the oil, but the oil is carrying them, mm -hmm. right? The oil is carrying them because they were extracted and there's nowhere else to go. So it makes Ayurvedic oils really powerful, doing kind of the same concept as an intermediary solvent, but... Um, but using this, now I fought against this and I still kind of resist this um, because one of my biggest problems with this is the amount of time that it takes to reduce 16 ounces of water out of, a, out of a pot. It takes a long time. It takes a couple of hours of simmering. Meanwhile, your oil is exposed to a couple of hours of heat, high heat. And heat is one of the primary damaging agents to oil. Heat is one of the things that will destroy oils more rapidly than anything. And damaged oils are one of the worst things that you can put on or into your body. They're really bad for you. They cause major disruption of, of structure and function of the body. They are nasty. And so I've always thought, oh, I just hate this idea. But then I learned that sesame oil contains a chemical called sesamin in it. And sesamin is an antioxidant. It protects oil, but it's only released from sesame when the sesame is heated. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you have to heat sesame oil. To get that. And then it releases this compound, which protects it from heat. Mm. <laughs> Wait. Right? <laughs> Can we just cook with sesame oil too? Oh yeah, yeah, you can. It has a distinctive. It does. It does. I mean, it's not like toasted sesame soda oil. It's not yeah. that strong, but it's pretty strong. Yeah. I was gonna ask, is that why you get toasted sesame oil so that it, it's already been heated up? No, because okay. you get toasted because it has that delicious flavor, flavor yes. that gorgeous taste. But that gorgeous taste is not something you'd want to like Everything. have on you all the time. You <laughs> wouldn't want us to be smelling like toasted right. sesame soy oil. So you always want to get an unrefined uh, sesame oil, have it raw. You want it to be activated when you heat it up, not, not beforehand. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but this is one of the reasons why sesame oil is used. And then ghee is extremely stable. It's a saturated fat. It's extremely stable. I would not trust this process in an oil that comes from more temperate climates. You would never do this with like, oh my God, with say rosehip seed oil, right? 
Someone might think, what a great idea. I'm going to make this precious oil of goju cola infused in rosehip seed oil. It's a great idea. But rosehip seed oil, the chemistry of rosehip seed oil, the fatty acids in there would be completely damaged from this process. You have to be very, very careful what oils you choose. But sesame, ghee, mm, they would be great, great, great. But isn't that a cool process? I love yeah, that. It's really cool. um, and then one other thing to remember when we're looking at the effects of goju cola on on tissue support is we want to remember that the gastrointestinal tract is also skin. It's epithelial tissue on the inside of our body, like skin is epithelial tissue on the outside of our body. And anything that stimulates healing of tissue stimulates healing of tissue. So goju cola is a plant that we can also automatically think of whenever we're thinking of anything for, uh, for reflux, esophageal irritation, ulcers, diverticulitis, um, colitis, IBS, any kind of irritation of the whole gastrointestinal tract because it's going to be soothing and calming and healing, stimulating new cell growth, stimulating collagen formation. It increases the production of collagen in tissues. It's a profound healer of, of tissues and a profound healer of the brain. It's, it's an amazing plant. And it, as it's a, it's a tonic, we want to take it all the time, having it regularly, putting it into, you know, many of your formulas. It makes its way into so many of my formulas. And growing it, you can grow it at home, and it's traditional to, when you're growing it, you can, they say to eat a leaf a day. So if you want to try one of those leaves, you can pass those around and nibble on one. And remember that it is in the celery and uh carrot family and see if you can kind of taste that oh, yeah. that uh flavor carrot, is it yeah. good for heartburn wow. you did carroty yeah carroty. Mm -hmm. yeah more but more bitter yeah it definitely oh, has that oh, really bitterness good. that bitterness is the the, the saponin so we we want i mean it should taste like what it is right it shouldn't taste completely like carrots because carrots don't have any of the 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 yeah. saponin glycosides yeah yeah um so is it good for heartburn? It would be great for heartburn. It would be great for heartburn in that it would help to soothe the esophageal irritation, right? It's not going to change the digestive function, um, but it's going to help with, with just kind of soothing any irritation there. Um, and also along with heartburn, oftentimes we get, um, we get um, dupa, 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 dupa duodenal ulcers, duodenal ulcers, which is uh, the uh, duodenum is the area where the stomach um, opens up into the small intestines. Uh, 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 so right at that point, um, if there's dysregulation of the, of the digestive system, um, sometimes you have what's supposed to happen is the, the mass of acidified food um, goes from the stomach down into the small intestine and immediately the pancreas um, squirts out basically baking soda. It's, it's um, sodium bicarbonate so to neutralize acid, right? Because it's alkaline and neutralizes acid. Um, so it's gonna neutralize all of that acid really, really quickly. Um, and if your system isn't kind of working up to, to snuff, if, this, if, it isn't, if it isn't secreting the right types of digestive juices, then it may be that the pancreas isn't secreting enough pancreatic juices then. And so sometimes along with the, the pain of, of heartburn, you also might notice some, some pain um, in the duodenum, which might be um, some duodenal irritation, possibly leading to a duodenal ulcer because of that disruption. So, um, Bitter herbs are really good for this. And this does have some bitterness to it, right? So um, we remember that the bitter flavor of plants gives us the action of bitters. It doesn't, it's not associated with a single plant or a single chemical. It's just the flavor of bitter going over our taste buds. This is bitter. Eating those leaves fresh is, is, is really, really bitter. So that could be, I mean, that could be your like digestive bitter and also your brain function support and your skin support and all of that is eating a leaf a day or eating a leaf right before your meals and having that bitter flavor activate there. So absolutely long um, response to, is it good for heartburn? Yeah, it's a very good for heartburn and other um, associated things. Uh, let's see. Um, so, um, 
do, do, do some clinical studies, improve, improve working memory and mood in elders who take it daily, better memory and overall mental ability in children with, um, with uh, mental impairment and reducing the startle response. Um, decreased corticosteroid levels. Um, so we see that people who have um, dysregulated um, uh, corticosteroid production from the adrenals, they're not producing the, um, the stress hormones at the correct times in the body and they're too high kind of later on in the morning or it's supposed to have a early morning spike and then it goes down later on. But when we're dealing with a lot of stress and a lot of dysregulated stress response, we get those later on, we get them at nighttime, we get it all over the time when they're not supposed to happen. And so we see an immediate um, decrease in corticosteroid production um, using uh, Goju Cola, again, kind of speaking to its effects on stress. So fabulous, fabulous plant. I love Goju Cola, any way you use it. Um, if you are going home from here, uh, I can give you a cutting of this and you can put it into, uh, into uh, soil and propagate it. I would do it. So if you want to that do that, we will, we will do that. All right. So, um, we have next week, I think, bring my, okay, I'm just going to remind us of what we have next week, but I, I left my calendar over there. Next oh. week, we'll have another plant. So, thanks for showing up. Yeah, thank you. Um, Rosa, let us know how it works for your husband. Right, along with all, and tell him about all those other beneficial side effects that he's going to be getting uh, when he uses the uh, when he uses the Goju Cola. All right, thanks for joining us. See you next week. Bye bye. I have a question. Yeah. On, like, I often find myself like, oh, 